finally worked. Second time's the charm. We are coming to you live from San Diego, California this week. I should show y'all my view. It's epic. The sailboat's beautiful. And I am not sad to be sitting up here in my room and hanging out with you guys on a Tuesday morning here, afternoon back at home. So thank you so much for joining us for this week's weekly webinar. And I am super stoked about this week's guest. They are new to the webinar series, but they are definitely not new to the chiropractic profession. They also have a very awesome podcast, which I'm hoping you two are going to share with them. But we have Dr. Chad Wilner and Dr. Andrew Wells, and they are talking to you about my most favorite topic. As you know, functional med. Dr. Cindy Howard just happens to be my BFF. And I'm going to tell you what, I can listen to her talk about functional medicine for hours. So I'm super excited that we're going to have this really cool webinar on simplified functional medicine because it's much needed because as you know, if you're familiar with functional med, simplified is not usually a word that is often applied to that. So I'm really excited to have both of you guys here today. And again, don't forget to talk about the podcast because it's awesome. So they're going to talk to you about Simplified Functional Med. We're going to talk about the podcast. We're going to share some great info. And don't forget, if you have questions, pop them in the chat. Even if you are one of the people who requested the link to the recording, if you pop that question in the chat box, it will go directly to me and I will share it with Dr. Chad and Dr. Andrew. We will get that question answered. If you pop it in there today during the live presentation, we will get it answered for you before we say goodbye. So gentlemen, take it away. Thank you so much. We appreciate being here. I was just going to say uh, San Diego has a very special place in my heart. Uh, all three of my children are adopted and my son Sam was born in San Diego. So we flew into San Diego to uh, pick him up at the hospital there in uh, Poway. And so every time I hear San Diego, I can't help but think of those wonderful times with my son being born down there. So uh, love San Diego. Absolutely. So uh, Andrew, did you want to do a quick plug for the podcasts, plural? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Chad and I host a podcast called uh, Surprise, Surprise, the Simplified Functional Medicine Podcast. And so if you want to learn more about our approach to functional medicine and how to help more patients and build your practice, you can do that on your ride to work or at home. You can just plug in our podcast. We have tons of episodes um, with all kinds of amazing guests. And we really break down exactly how we uh, we approach functional medicine in a simplified way. And then we also just launched recently a podcast with our partners from Erconia called The Laser Light Show. And that's a podcast dedicated to the clinical benefits of using low-level laser therapy to solve all kinds of chronic health issues. A lot of people don't realize that lasers can actually be used um, for a lot of different functional medicine conditions. So I think a lot of times doctors relate low-level laser therapy or laser therapy in general, cold laser, to things like musculoskeletal pain. But there's all kinds of amazing applications for functional medicine. So if functional medicine is a topic you're interested in, those two podcasts are a, a great place to start. And so uh, I wanted to kick off this podcast. We're going to jump in, by the way. This is We have a short amount of time here. And so the benefit to you guys is we're going to uh, show you behind the curtain on exactly our our clinical approach and our strategy in helping patients. And I wanted to kick this off and just letting you know that this approach that we created, Dr. Wolner and I really was, uh, was created out of failure. Uh, about six years ago, I was running two really busy practices and we had patients coming in for conditions I would kind of lump in the functional medicine bucket. We had patients with fatigue, digestive issues, hormone problems, anxiety, depression. And, and while some of these things can definitely be helped by chiropractic care, we didn't really have a whole lot of tools to help those patients. And so I decided one day that we were going to implement functional medicine. So I signed up for a functional medicine training course, went through about six months of training. And after that, I was excited to launch it, but I had no idea where to start. We had dozens of lab tests that we could use, dozens of different protocols, which we'll go over today. And I was so confused. Uh, I just didn't know how to actually implement it with patients. And so we actually hired a coach to fly to our practice and spend a weekend with us to show us how to do, like, what do we do on day one? What do we do on day two? And she spent a lot of time with us trying to trying to organize it. And after that weekend, I was more confused than before that weekend started. And so we had this kind of this fork in the road and we had a choice. Do we either focus all, and go all in on functional medicine and be a functional medicine practice? Or do we just focus on what was already working in our practice? And so reluctantly, 
we scrapped our whole ambition is to do functional medicine just because it was so complex and so confusing. It was a huge distraction to what was already working really well in our practice. And so I, I uh, humbly raised my hand and say, I'm a functional medicine failure. And then a few years after that, Dr. Wolner called me and he said, hey, Andrew, I've got this great idea for a functional medicine program. And I'm like, dude, we already tried that. <laughs> His uh, Chad actually struggled implementing functional medicine as well. I'm like, you know, thanks, but no thanks. I'm not really interested. I tried functional medicine. I just couldn't figure out administratively how to work. And they said, no, I've got a whole different approach. Give me 45 minutes and let me explain to you this new approach to functional medicine. And so that's the approach we're going to share with you guys on the call today. When I first heard it from Dr. Wilner, it made way too much sense to me. And I wish I had known this uh, uh, six, six years ago when I initially tried to do functional medicine, because this is what I originally thought functional medicine was. And I found out the hard way that it was way, you know, a lot of approaches are just way too complex. And so uh, that's kind of our segue into this topic. And docs, if you're on the, uh, the call live or on the recording, um, please, please, please pay attention because this has had an amazing effect on hundreds of clinics across the U.S. I think we have clinics in almost 40 states across the U.S. We've worked with uh, well over 100 doctors in implementing this streamlined and, and simplified approach to functional medicine. So thank you guys for being on. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Wolner, and we're just going to get started and jump right into to this approach. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Wells, and feel free to chime in at any point. Um, so, Docs, like Dr. Wells said, um, you know, this was really born out of out of frustration. And so what we're going to share with you, we're going to jump right in and really show you kind of the three clinical keys to helping more patients. It's at the end of the day, this is what this is all about. It's first and foremost, helping as many people as we can really make an impact. But but reciprocally on the other side of it too is that this has to make sense financially from a business standpoint as well, because ultimately you're not going to be able to help as many people if you're struggling and if the business model is convoluted and complex. And so, here are the three clinical keys. Number one, possibilities versus probabilities. Number two, chasing symptoms versus fixing root causes. And number three, dispensing versus empowerment. So I'm going to go through each one of these with you and really show you this kind of different simplified approach. So when it comes to uh, the idea of possibilities versus probabilities, this is, I think, one of the key distinctions between what we're doing versus what so many other conventional approaches uh, take into consideration, right? So for a minute, if a patient comes to your practice, uh, assume that they're complaining of fatigue and digestive issues, let's say. If we view that patient through the lens of what's possible, Docs, I want you to answer the question for me. What's possible in terms of what's driving these problems? Fatigue, digestive issues, what's possible? Well, what's possible is really anything, any possible. So we'll wind up doing it, seeing all sorts of diagrams that like this. And I get it, it's kind of silly over the top, but all joking aside, this is typically the reason why so many of these different approaches are so complex and convoluted, why they require hundreds of different lab tests, hundreds of different settlement protocols, is because they begin with this idea of what's possible. And quite frankly, anything is possible. With our approach, we approach it through the lens of what's probable. This is what our diagrams typically look like. A lot more streamlined, obviously, test, result, and then a plan as a result of that. Uh, test, right? So this approach that we take is not an ending to everyone type approach. So we view this through kind of that classic 80-20 lens, right? Meaning 80% of the patients or more, I would say, are dealing with what we would consider relatively uncomplicated issues, fatigue, digestive issues, difficulty losing weight, hormone problems, depression, anxiety. The vast majority of them are not dealing with mysterious stuff, right? That's the minority. Most people are not dealing with the super rare, complex, mysterious issues. We tell docs all the time, refer these to the specialists. That's what the functional medicine gurus are there for, is for these complex cases. But fortunately, the vast majority of patients that are coming in your clinic that are dealing with these kind of classic chronic health issues aren't dealing with serious issues, right? Again, it's about what's probable, not what's possible. And so, on that same level or through that same kind of lens, we're talking about the difference between being justified versus simplified, right? So for instance, if a patient comes in complaining of fatigue, are you justified in ordering a CBC, a thyroid panel? Yeah, of course you are, right? Are you justified if they have digestive issues, ordering a GI pathogen test and or more? 
Yeah. Or depression, doing a neurotransmitter profile, or for hormone problems, doing a hormone profile for anxiety, doing organic acid testing for insomnia, doing a sleep study for weight problems, doing genetic testing, et cetera, et cetera. You get what we're saying here. You're completely justified in ordering all these different labs. But again, for us, we're saying, okay, is there a common root issue behind most of these issues? Is there a common kind of thread or root cause that we can identify and look at most of the time? And the answer is yes, it's a resounding yes. And that is more often than not, the HPA axis is what we're talking about. Okay. So in order for us to kind of look at this, what we're gonna do is go through kind of an, a simplified overview of the hormone pathway in terms of looking at this, that lens of the HPA axis. So when stress, is encountered, it sends a signal to the brain. The brain then sends a signal to our adrenal glands via the hypothalamus, hence the H of the HPA axis, right? Hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So it sends a signal from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland, to the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands then produce pregnenolone. Again, there are a series of other uh, various enzymatic steps and things like that here and other things. But again, this is the simplified view of this. So, pregnenolone is then converted to DHEA, which is then further converted into estrogen and testosterone. But then pregnenolone is also converted into progesterone, which is the direct precursor to cortisol. Okay. So, with increased stress, we have an increased cortisol demand. And so, uh, as stress continues, the alarm is continued to be signaled. And then ultimately what it says is we need to produce more cortisol to combat the stress. And that oftentimes comes at the expense of some of these other key hormone signals, right? And so the bottom line is this, the body begins shifting normal hormone production in various ways in an effort to produce more cortisol, which is what leads to many times HPA axis dysfunction, okay? And because the HPA axis impacts so many different body systems, it impacts things like energy, hormone production, mood, digestion, immune function, and more. When it stops functioning properly, it creates a wide range of different problems. Things like thyroid problems, fatigue, brain fog, sleep problems, chronic pain, depression, anxiety, mood swings, hormone problems, digestive issues, and more. Okay. This is what we call HPA axis dysfunction, or we refer to this as a rhythm imbalance problem. Okay. So, Chad, so, I want to I want to stop you there yeah. and just just uh, point something out here. There is a, a study done recently in the U.S. Seventy three percent of Americans would tell you and identify that they're stressed out. So either because they've been diagnosed as stressed out, or they'll just tell you I'm stressed out. And number two, they they feel what they uh, describe as the effects of stress. And you know sometimes we kind of throw this word or like oh yeah I'm stressed out or I'm busy, but stress is a real issue. And so when we're talking about HPA axis dysfunction or a rhythm imbalance, what we're really talking about here is a brain body miscommunication. The brain is sending yeah. a signal to the body and the body is sending a signal to a brain to the brain that it's stressed out. And if you leave that uncorrected for a long amount, uh, for a long period of time, it, it triggers these chronic health issues. Another well, way of looking at it, which is a common, like a common buzzword in functional medicine right now is the gut brain axis. And we'll talk a little bit about that. That's become a really popular um, uh, concept in functional medicine, but we're really talking about the same, the same thing here. Right. And the thing that I would just simply reiterate too, is when we say stress, we're thinking about stress in a very kind of classic chiropractic sense in that, you know, they talk about in, in original kind of chiropractic philosophy, the three T's thoughts, tra traumas, and toxins, right? We talk about this through the lens of emotional stress, uh, physical stress, and chemical stress, right? So it's, it's a variety. It's not just the I'm stressed because of my job or because of my relationship or whatever. This is a much broader context, right? So how do we assess the effects of stress on the body and or is this if this is the cause, the root cause of their issue? Um, so first, we do what we call the rhythm and balance survey. And so this is a good step of getting in the ballpark. We have a simple survey that we have patients take, and this lets us know pretty loud and clear right out the gates. Yeah, this is probably what we're dealing with. Step two, we do a specific health concern survey. And then step three, we do what's called the adrenal stress index test. Okay. So this ASI test, it measures cortisol rhythm, morning, noon, late afternoon, and night. It measures DHEA. It measures insulin. 
fasting and non-fasting. It measures 17 OH progesterone, which is a direct precursor to uh, cortisol. It measures something called secretory IgA, which is an immune mediator cell that lets us know uh, how the immune system is functioning, and particularly in the digestive system. Um, and then it measures gluten antibodies. So it gives us a lot of, it packs a pretty heavy punch for what it's looking at. And more importantly, what it does is it gives us a really good window into how the body is responding to stress and or if uh, one of these types of stressors is really the driver. And, and what's powerful behind this, and especially as we go through this with you, you'll start to see that what this does is this allows us to really work through and cut through a lot of the white noise and a lot of the muddy and muddiness and murkiness that can often accompany all the different various tests. Because again, the patients that come in and see us, they've already been tested with for thyroid issues. They've already been tested for gut issues. They've already been tested for just about everything. And a lot of times these can create more questions than answers for a lot of patients. And so what this can do is really cut through the heart of the matter and really understand what's really driving these problems. So it's an at-home salivary test. So it can be drop shipped to the patient, which is great because a lot of our practitioners are doing kind of telemedicine as a result of this. You don't have to have the patient directly in the practice, which is awesome. And so the ASA test is so powerful again, because what it does is it allows us to cut through a lot of the noise with all the different symptoms and really identify that, look, uh, there's one key problem that's driving all of this. And so it allows us to really organize our efforts and simplify the conversation with the patient. Um, and so it makes for a massive difference in terms of that. So stress is the primary driver. What we're gonna do is measure in an objective way how stress is impacting the body, okay? So this is what a quote unquote normal AS test looks like. What's doing right there is it's measuring cortisol in the morning all the way through the night, right? And so the blue line represents the patient's cortisol output as measured at morning, noon, afternoon, and night. And so the green area represents the normal cortisol range of, of production there. And so normally it should rise in the morning and then gradually fall by the end of the day, right? Or this is looking at, you could refer to this as almost that uh, kind of daytime window of that normal um, circadian rhythm, right? And it should fall within the green, obviously, which represents the normal reference range. So this is an important measurement because cortisol obviously has such far-reaching effects on the body, right? Cortisol affects blood sugar, it affects digestion, it affects immune function, it affects mood, it affects thyroid function, inflammation, and much, much more. And so when we look at that, this can often be a key uh, indicator of why so many of these different areas or things are, are not functioning properly, right? And which is why there's so many different symptoms that patients will present with when this is off, right? So cortisol rhythm, uh, excuse me, cortisol rhythm gives us a window into how the brain is communicating with the body and the body back to the brain, kind of like what Dr. Wells just said there, right? So when we assess this, we see three primary types of problems. These are categorized into three distinct stages or phases. Stage one is what we call the alarm stage, right? Here we typically see elevated cortisol levels. Stage two is the resistance stage. Here we typically see mixed cortisol levels, sometimes even seemingly quote unquote normal cortisol levels. And then stage three is the burnout stage. Here we typically see low or suppressed cortisol levels, okay? Before we go into each of these and show examples of these, I wanna make sure everybody is following along uh, is this making sense? If this is making sense, if you guys can just type into the chat box, yes, this is making sense, following along. Um, Andrew, is there anything you want to add? In pop, in pop culture health, you'll hear oftentimes the concept of, of needing to lower cortisol. Like stress is high, you need to lower cortisol. But what we see in stage two and, and oh, yeah. much in stage three, it's not always about lo lowering cortisol. Sometimes your cortisol levels are low and they need to be raised. And so You'll see yes. a lot of like supplements on the market, like reduce cortisol. Cortisol is bad. It's not that. It's just being produced sometimes in the wrong uh, amounts at the wrong at the wrong time, but sometimes in really low levels. And so that's one of the really um, often yeah. things when you're looking at chronic stress. Yeah, well, and, and not only that, but I would further say that oftentimes well-intentioned doctors can prescribe various supplements that are intended or designed to help. Uh, lower or suppress cortisol, and that can only, in some instances, be making things worse. We'll show you an example of that. And, and so without this test, 
um, any sort of supplements that you're going to prescribe that can or will influence cortisol, uh, you're, you're somewhat flying blind without really truly seeing what's happening. And we'll go through that in just a second. Um, but Andrew, are you able to see in the comments, this everybody following along, making sense? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, soon, Ashley, Maria, uh, Jason, uh, Maria, thank you guys for, for uh, uh, posting in the chat box. Cool. Awesome. So stage one. Okay. So with stage one problems, we see elevated cortisol levels uh, as the body's initial response to, to stress, right? So this is what a stage one, kind of a classic stage one would look like, right? Fairly high outside that reference range, right? This is largely the result of the body's effort to fight off stress. So this is, you know, even though this test is abnormal, this is a normal response to stress, right? The body's just doing what it's meant to do, right? So often is the case, the body gets kind of demonized for doing what it's meant to do. Very similar with like, let's say the whole cortisol story, right? When, or um, cholesterol, excuse me, we're talking about cortisol, the whole cholesterol story, right? We oftentimes see elevated cholesterol, but it's just the body trying to respond or adapt normally to uh, another type of stress on the body, right? And so this is, this is the body's effort to try and adapt, right? And so notice how cortisol levels have risen above the green reference range. So then all of a sudden, over time, if that uh, doesn't work, so to speak, if the problems continue, stage pr two problems occur as a direct re result of the body's failure to address the ongoing stress. So this would be a classic stage two, right? And, and technically speaking, right, it looks somewhat normal. So how do you know if this isn't a normal? And a good question that sometimes docs will ask is, well, do you ever see normal tests? Yes, we do. We definitely see normal tests. But the thing that gives this away as a stage two and not a, just kind of a low end of normal is number one, this patient, I guarantee you, is presenting with fatigue, digestive issues, et cetera, et cetera. Those type, the patient's presentation in conjunction with this kind of gives it away, right? Versus a patient who's like, I feel great. I'm doing fine. And this comes in. Then you'd be like, well, that's normal. But the other thing too is other markers we look at on the ASI test will also give this away as well, which we'll show you in just a minute here too. So the truth is what's actually happening is that cortisol levels are actually falling here, right? Think of this in a dynamic sense not in a static sense, right? Over time, as the body fails to adapt, it's going to start falling, right? Think of the old saying, what goes up must come down. That's what happens here, right? So then ultimately, stage three problems are a result of the body's failure to adapt to stress. Eventually, the HPA access is no longer to keep up with the demands. So cortisol levels begin to fall low below the normal levels, right? So notice how cortisol levels here have dropped below the green reference range. So Think about it like this. This is another way of looking at it, kind of what we said, that what goes up must come down, right? Over a period of time there at the bottom, think about that, uh, months or even years, right? And then here we have total cortisol production. If, if stress is introduced, right, all of a sudden the body responds by elevating to try and fight off that stress and combat it. But again, if things don't, don't, uh, don't adapt, uh, then all of a sudden what happens is it starts to begin falling. And there's a certain period of time there where, again, you can see that stage two might actually appear somewhat normal, right? But what you're really looking at is just a snapshot in time where it's kind of masquerading like a normal level when in reality it's a stage two. And then eventually it leads to burnout, right? And that's the that's the low end, that's stage three, okay? Hey, uh, Dr. So, Wilmer, I wanted to interject something. The reason this is so um, so important, especially at this, this time in, in our culture, is that um, not only are stress levels rising, but the amount of, of um, uh, the amount of stress and the amount of um, potential stressors in our environment are, are worse than ever before. People spend way more time on social media. They spend way yeah. too much time looking through news feeds. Um, people are worried about their job. They're worried about finances. They're worried about the economy. They're worried about wars. They're worried about vaccines. They're worried about um, pandemics. All these things that people have. Uh, unfortunately yeah. way too much access to in terms of information really freaks people out. And so in, if you're not spending lots of time outdoors or lots of time with friends and family in support groups, lots of time around people and just living like sort of a natural life, uh, our bodies become a lot less stress resilient. And so that's why yeah. this is becoming even more important now than even 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And why this is such, you're, you're seeing these cases right now in your practice. You have dozens of people every day that come in your practice that are dealing with exactly this thing, 
which is why, again, we developed a program around helping this, this specific type of issue. Yeah, the, the timing couldn't be better for you, Doc, to jump in and start helping with this, right? So secretory IgA is something else that this measures. Uh, it plays a critical role in our immune function, protects us from harmful invaders like bacterial, parasitic, and fungal infections. It's particularly important in helping to protect our digestive system. So one of its primary roles is that it's actively monitoring our digestive system to look for potential threats and then respond to and eliminate those threats, right? So when we find altered levels of secretory IgA on the test, which we frequently do, it could mean that you're susceptible to a wide range of opportunistic infections. Maybe the patient is already dealing with some type of infection or that your immune system is having uh, diff uh, various problems, right? So this is a really important one because oftentimes this allows us to really start to piece together in a broader sense what's really driving a lot of the patient's problems, right? So here's a, here's a stage one in context, right? So right here, uh, you can, uh, excuse me, you can see, right, 17-year-old uh, female here, you can see uh, cortisol levels are elevated, total cortisol is 47, you can see on the curve there. But then what you can see as well is um, insulin levels are high, which we'll talk about in just a minute there. You can see their non-fasting insulin levels are high, uh, but secretory IgA is normal here in this one, right? A stage two, um, you can see there, uh, right there, and, and um, uh, their DHEA is low. Um, and then a stage three, um, you can see in terms of the curve there, but then also you can see secretory IgA is borderline low as well. So that's, we typically find it's not uncommon to find a, a pretty clear association with uh, a, a stage three with low secretory IgA. That's not uncommon at all there. So, so um, something um, I want to add really quickly to this um, feedback from the doctors who have been in our program, um, maybe have been out of school for a long time and, and forget how to read um, traditional labs. Like they don't, if you put like a thyroid panel in front of them or a CBC or other, like dozens of other tests, they really, you know, if you didn't learn them in school or didn't learn them outside of school, sometimes these labs can be really difficult to determine and, and analyze. One of the nice things about the ASI test is we have, um, we have a lot of docs who would not identify as functional medicine experts, but really quickly were able to show them how to read the ASI test, how to interpret it, and how to start using that, those metrics and biomarkers to start helping patients. And so yeah. I can teach anybody how to read an ASI test and analyze some of the nuances in that test within 10 or 15 minutes so that you feel like yeah. an expert when you're getting results back. Right. Yeah, exactly. Great, great point, right? So this patient was struggling with anxiety and depression. And one of the things we teach our doctors to do when they look at this is try and frame what we see on the test results with their initial complaint or their primary complaint, because oftentimes you'll see a picture in vivid detail of what's happening in their life with this test. For example, this patient in particular, I asked him, I said, do you find that you're oftentimes dealing with kind of highs and lows? And they're like, well, yeah, of course, anxiety and depression, duh. And I said, well, do you find that you're kind of low around the noon frame, you know, morning and noon, but then all of a sudden you get kind of this peak, uh, maybe even feeling to the point of a little bit of anxiety in the late afternoon and then back. And she's like, exactly. She's like this. Is, and I showed her the test. And she was like, this is exactly mirroring what I'm feeling. Now, that's not always the case. I don't want to paint this uh, picture as though it's perfectly matched a story, but I would say more often than not, it really does. It's a fairly good indicator, right? So this is what we would consider a fairly classic stage two, because there's mixed levels there, right? So um, this patient here was struggling with fatigue and depression. And so not surprisingly, one of the markers came back. They had low secretory IgA, right? And then again, this is their test right there. So again, this would be kind of a, a stage two borderline getting ready to, to shift into more of a stage three. You can see that. Be, and we say stage three because look at total cortisol output is 23. So they're just hanging on there. So technically speaking, if you wanted to get really technical, we could say this is a, uh, a stage 2.8 seven, nine, right. Or something like that. But you see it's a stage two headed to stage three, right? So the importance of measuring insulin is important because this is going to give you a, a lot more window into energy production, highs and lows, weight resistance is going to be a big one. But another big one too is going to be, uh, uh, this is going to give you a window into 
um, mood disorders, right, in terms of anxiety and or depression, right? So insulin also impacts a wide range of different metabolic functions and biological processes. This patient was struggling with depression, anxiety, and having difficulty losing weight. So all of the above, right? And so you can see there elevated levels, but I want to highlight something. This is directly on the test. It says it. It says insulin activity is affected by the stress response. Chronic stress with cortisol elevation may counteract the effects of insulin and may lead to functional insulin resistance. This is not the same as kind of diabetic insulin resistance, but nonetheless, it'll still have an effect in terms of metabolism throughout the body and or mood and or a whole lot of other things, right? Equals fatigue, weight resistance, depression, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So again, you can see why this test is so powerful because it's giving us a lot more information as to what's driving a lot of these problems that people are dealing with. So this was a brand new study in 2021 that Stanford did. They found that insulin resistance doubles uh, the risk of major depressive disorder, right? So a lot of times what the doctors will do in patients is they'll say, oh, insulin resistance leads to depression, right? That's not what we're saying and that's not what we want to read from the study. What we want to do is we want to say, look, chronic stressors are what lead to rhythm imbalances, which is what leads to HPA axis dysfunction, which leads to their current state, which may incorporate or include a functional insulin resistance as well, right? But what we're saying is this study just really echoes a lot of what we're saying here, right, is that chronic stress leads to a whole host of imbalances. That's what's driving it, right? And the reason why we say that is because if you look at insulin resistance as the driver, which you shouldn't do that, then the, the answer is going to be short-sighted, right? Well, you got to just make sure that you're eating keto and that'll help or, or paleo or, or make some sort of simple dietary shift, which we're not saying you shouldn't do that. You definitely should. But it's it's deeper than that, right? So hopefully yeah, another, you guys recognize this nuance. Another way of putting that is your body is stuck in a sympathetic state, and it's yes. the parasympathetic activity is reduced. So it doesn't matter what diet you eat or yes. uh, what you're putting in your body. If you're stuck in sympathetic, you're not going to digest and process that food for energy normally anyway. So what what Dr. Wilner is saying is that the root 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 cause of all of this is chronic stress. And so we're talking yeah. again about brain body communication and fixing that uh, fixes a lot of these, these chronic symptoms that you're seeing with your patients. Yeah. And, and, and it's the, it's the classic correlation or causation, right? Um, we're saying that, it, that well, this finding is a correlation. It's not the causation, right? So you can think of it one of two ways, right? Is insulin resistance driving the depression or is the depression driving the insulin resistance? The answer is yes. And yes. Right. So, once we've uncovered the root issue with the ASI test, how do we actually fix our patient's problems, right? So now I know that like we could dive in and we could spend literally what I'm about to share with you here. We're going to give you just a brief overview of this. And if you want more information, we'll gladly um, show you in more detail. We can, we can chat about that. But we normally spend, um, you know, at, at our live trainings, docs will come out and we'll literally spend an entire weekend workshopping with them showing them hands-on and having them experience a lot of the strategies that we use with our patients. We use some pretty, uh, pretty remarkable and pretty uh, unconventional, but really uh, powerful uh, strategies that are backed by really sound evidence and science. It's actually really, really cool. But um, we, we primarily fix our uh, patients' problems, first things first, through an empowerment approach. And what we mean by that is most of the conventional approaches that are out there, including a lot of the functional medicine, appear a lot more allopathic than I think functional medicine was originally intended to be, right? Is that, okay, the conventional approach is we did all these tests. Now, here's the supplements to address what we found on the tests, right? And that's one way of doing it. We're, we're not necessarily saying that's inherently bad or wrong, but what we're saying, which is more effective, is through a simplified testing process that we do and patient education, we're able to empower the patient by showing them things they can do and they should do beyond just taking a handful of supplements at certain times. Although that's important, again, it needs to be more comprehensive if we're going to really, uh, really move the needle for our patients in a, in a meaningful way, right? So we do this through two primary vehicles, what we call the four pillars of health restoration, 
Um, and these are specific protocols that we've developed over the years. But then the really long-term sticking kind of point of this is what we call the five fundamentals of health. This is a lifestyle training curriculum that we use with patients to help them understand a lot of the things that they need to know and more importantly do and implement um, to be able to get these changes right. Because I think all of us can recognize if, if I were to ask any one of our doctors on this training here, what are the things patients should be doing to get better results with their chiropractic care and or improve their health? All of us could name off, rattle off, you know, really quickly a lot of those things. But the question is, how do we get patients to actually do those things? And so our five fundamentals of health lifestyle training curriculum is geared way more towards instead of just telling them, okay, here's what you got to do. We do it in a way that's meaningful because we focus on the very latest and best cutting edge science and research behind uh, habit formation and change and, and personal development, psychology, all of those things. We house it in such a way that it's been proven to actually get our patients to do those things, right? It's one thing to, to, to hear those things and to quote unquote know them. But uh, as Stephen R. Covey once wisely said, to know and not do is to not really know. And so for us, it's not just a matter of getting patients to know these things, but again, getting them to adopt and to do these things, that's what's going to drive, drive uh, everything for them. So you can think of this as... um, Yeah, Dr. Wilner, I want to interject something. One of the things that Dr. Wilner and I find very, very frustrating about a lot of functional medicine approaches is that the patients, uh, when they sign up for a program, they go home with this garbage bag full of supplements. And the doctor's like, all right, take your supplements. That's going to fix all your problems. The patient's like, okay, cool, great. I've got all these supplements. But we all we all know, the doctor knows, the patient knows, you guys on the call know, if you're not changing your habits, you're not making any long-term, uh, 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 long-term changes in, in, as it applies to your health. And so there is no magic supplement. There is no magic test. Those are all great things. But if we're not changing personal habits at home, then it's not, you're wasting your time and you're wasting your patient's money. And so what, we're, what we've done is we've taken the best testing and supplement protocols and combined them with the best habit formation protocols to make sure not only do your, your patients get the best results possible, but you look like the hero because you've actually changed what they're doing at home. And that's one of the trickiest things about functional medicine. Uh, and one of the things that we find very frustrating about a, a lot of conventional approaches to functional medicine that we've, to a large extent, solved. Yeah. In a, in a very, very simple way too, right? So what are the four pillars of health restoration? And again, we could dive into these super deep, but this is going to be the, the kind of cliff notes version for you guys. So you could at least understand where we're going with these things. First is rhythm resetting. We got to reset that rhythm. That lies at the core of everything, right? So what we do is through a specific combination of some supplements that we use and, and specific timing of those supplements based around what we find on that test, we begin to literally reset that curve, that that uh, cortisol curve throughout the day. So we want to reset that rhythm so that is functioning uh, properly, right? And this is at the heart of it because in essence, what we're doing is we're not even so much uh, concerned with cortisol per se, although yes, we're, we're concerned with cortisol, but really we're using that as a window into how the brain is communicating with the body and how the body is communicating back to the brain. If we can reset that curve, what in essence we're doing is getting back online that brain body communication. We're resetting that, right? That's the beginning, right? The second is nutritional healing. And so again, we personalize this for the patient. We have some tools, resources that we use to make it really easy for us to help develop a personalized plan for them to help begin uh, healing, healing the gut, healing the brain, healing the body, right? And so we'll use some specific uh, nutritional guidelines for them. And then also, if necessary, in some instances, for instance, if a patient is dealing with altered levels of secretory IgA, and it's very clear that they are dealing with some type of, uh, you know, bacterial or parasitic pathogen, that we want to address that as well. So we can use specific supplements in specific uh, doses, timing, and whatnot to help address those issues there. Uh, so nutritional healing is a big part as well. Stress resiliency is probably one of the factors that gets neglected uh, out of all of, of the different factors. And this is why we are very deliberate about this because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to uh, proverbially pull someone out of the fire only to throw them back into the fire, right? 
And so what we're trying to do here with stress resiliency is really help build them to a stronger state so that their body, their brain, their body can cope with the stressors that, that put them where they're at in the first place, right? And so how do we do this? Well, our stress resiliency strategies, we incorporate a variety of different tools and resources, right? So we, we talk about and we give specific breath work strategies. We, we talk about uh, cold immersion therapy, how this is a very uh, evidence-based approach to helping develop uh, stress resiliency. The term that, that we use, if you've heard of before, is hormesis. We do different types of hormetic activities, right? Um, think about exercise for a minute. What is exercise? Well, exercise is a healthy form of stress on the body. Exercise in the right dose, right? Too much exercise can be detrimental to people's health, right? We see that patients over exercise, you know, or, or have, have, have over conditioned themselves. Um, and so stress resiliency is a really powerful thing. Specifically, we use some technology. We use a biofeedback tool with our patients that allows us to help them on their own build their stress resiliency. And more importantly, which, really, which is really cool, they can objectively measure and see their resiliency improving through using this tool. And so it's a really, really awesome way to help with stress resiliency. And then last but not least, functional therapy. And so as chiropractors, chiropractors know, uh, well, chiropractic would fit into functional therapy. Maybe corrective exercise might be a strategy that we use, so we can use that as well. One of the strategies that we have recently adopted, incorporated as part of our functional therapy strategies is, as Andrew kind of alluded to at the beginning, low-level laser therapy is a powerful tool that we plug in. What we've done is we've provided training for all of our practitioners in our program of how to incorporate low-level laser therapy. We've shown specific protocols to address things like fatigue, depression, anxiety, hormone problems, um, dysbiosis in the gut, et cetera, et cetera. There's specific protocols that we teach to help with that. That is what we would consider a functional therapy to assist in the process. But ultimately, what we've done is we've created a comprehensive approach so that uh, kind of no stone is left unturned um, so we can really, really provide patients with a complete solution, right? So that being said, common questions we get asked. Do you provide marketing systems with our program? Do you provide business coaching? Do you have an easy follow system uh, or and or systems and protocols? Our answer, yes. And so at this point in time, obviously we could go on for hours and hours, but what we would offer for you guys is just to hop on a free demo with us. And so here's our special offer. For anyone who sets up a free demo call today, we'll give you our 90-day runway marketing program plus our practice growth masterclass for free. It's just our way of saying thank you for jumping on a demo call. And really what will happen on the demo call, um, if you want to schedule that, go to simplifiedfunctionalmedicine.com slash demo and you can get that scheduled. Andrew, do you want to make, talk about that demo call? Yeah, I just put a, a link in the chat box if you're on live. Otherwise, if you're listening on a recording, just go to the um, that link that, that Dr. Wolner just mentioned. So what we do is we want to show you, like for docs, you're like, yeah, you know, this kind of makes sense. I'm interested. I could see a need for this in my practice. Or maybe you've looked for functional medicine programs in the past and they never made sense to you. Uh, what we do on the demo calls, we actually show you exactly what our doctors see, what our clients see, what our members see, and how we help you launch, learn and launch a simplified functional medicine program in less than a month. And so what we do is we literally take you by the hand and show you what resources that you have that are available to you, how we train you, um, how we connect you with other doctors doing sim the, the same thing. Um, and we really help sh make sure that this is impactful. Um, what we want, one of the most frustrating things I find about programs, any program in the chiropractic profession is that, and I've probably all done this, we've purchased programs and they sit on a shelf and never become implemented. Um, we're very serious about helping you actually implement what you've learned um, in, on this call or in our training. And so we kind of uh, lift the curtain and show you behind the curtain on how we actually make this impactful. So at the end of the day, you can help more patients, either patients who are already in your practice or patients in your community, but also do it in a way that doesn't give you an extra job or um, pull you in a direction outside of what you're already doing with your chiropractic practice. And so we want this to be supportive. So again, so you can help more patients and also grow your business in a very simple and streamlined way. So the demo call is just a way to, to do a deeper dive and to answer uh, more specific questions that you might have. Um, Dr. Wolner and I can talk about this for hours, um, but the demo call is really for people who are um, curious about um, what it would look like to implement this in their in their practice.
Demo call typically lasts about an hour. Um, if you schedule your demo call, um, we'll send you uh, a more in-depth training of what we talked about today. And then also, um, as Dr. Wilder mentioned, we'll send you this 90-day runway uh, program for free. And that's something that we sell typically for about 400 bucks. So awesome. Yeah. Thank you all for being here. It will, we'll open this up to questions. Anybody that has any questions, um, feel free to, to let us know and we can answer any questions. Hopefully we have a little bit more time. We do. And we actually do have a question. Um, will a doc still need to have the degree of functional medicine? Uh, in terms of being able to do this, is that, is that what they're asking a certification? I, I think so. Yeah. No, I mean, it's obviously going to vary by state. I think most states besides New York are fairly open in terms of being able to, your DC degree would allow you to be able to do everything within the parameters of the protocols that we do. Um, that being said, we do provide certification in our program uh, to uh, basically our certification is to teach and train docs. So they're certified in the same protocols we're using with our patients. It would be basically a, a health fundamental practitioner is what they get certified as. So in essence, it's a type of functional medicine certification that they would receive through us through our program. Hopefully that answers the question. It does. She yeah, just in, in, in yes, general. She meant meant question. Question. What's that, Andrew? Yeah, I was going to say in, in, in general, no, you don't need any kind of special certification to, to, to do this with your patients. Yeah. Um, how much do you charge per patient? Great question, right? We leave that largely up to the practitioners. That being that we do give a, a framework. Most of our providers that are in our program are usually charging for a 90 day program for patients somewhere in the ballpark of around three to $4,000. Um, and then for a six month program, six to $7,000 is a pretty typical um, ballpark range. Wouldn't you say Andrew? Yeah. In, in general, in functional medicine, you're looking at most, most, programs, you're looking at roughly about the same. Um, some docs will charge, I know there's some programs that charge in upwards of ten to $15,000 for a six-month program. Uh, we try to make it uh, profitable for the doctor, but not uh, gouging the patient as well. So we try to, uh, our, our program offers an immense amount of value to patients. It's profitable to doctors, but not, uh, yeah, it's not going to break the bank for most patients. And we try and make it affordable for the docs as well, right? So that you're not dragging in overhead in terms of paying thousands and thousands of dollars for tests and supplements, things like that. We try and make this uh, extremely profitable for our provider. Is this covered by insurance? Uh, the, the the short answer is no, but for like, so in my practice, we accept insurance. And so certain aspects, if you want to, you can provide uh, insurance benefits too. So for instance, as, as the, let's say the functional therapy portion, if I can include a certain number of chiropractic adjustments, you could offset the cost of the program that way. So depending upon how you want to structure it, and that's something that uh, myself or more than likely Andrew could show you how to structure in such a way to use insurance to offset certain aspects because again hopefully you're seeing that this is more than just a uh, conventional functional medicine program where it's just testing and supplements it's a much more of comprehensive approach and so you have the flexibility if you choose to be able to um you know offset some of the costs with insurance depending upon what you're doing anything you want to add to that andrew yeah and thankfully for the most part thankfully this is not covered by insurance and what i mean by that is it um, when, when patients are looking for things, oftentimes with functional medicine that's covered by insurance, they're looking for quick fixes. And a lot of patients that are attracted to our type of practice and program, they're looking for holistic approaches to their health issues. And they already understand that most of these things are not covered by insurance, if at all. Yeah. And so what happens yeah. is you get a very motivated patient here. Like they already get, they know the deal, right? Um, they know it's going to cost some money for testing they know it's going to cost some money for the actual program. And so what you end up is you get a lot of patients who are, um, they're very serious and very compliant uh, with their program. And so when, when patients enroll in the program, um, they're, they're there because they want to get better. And that's a much more fun patient to deal with than somebody who's just looking for a quick fix. And they often end up, those patients typically end up in their primary care doc or specialist looking for the magic pill that, that you know, we all know doesn't exist. Yeah, and, and I would I would just simply echo or add to that, Ducks, if we didn't already make this really clear, 
um, we get really great clinical results with our patients. Hopefully that, that goes without saying, but I did want to reiterate, maybe emphasize that, that um, not only in my practice, but we also, we have the luxury or kind of the benefit. It's really exciting. Each week we do what are called CSD calls with our provider. So all of our doctors are able to jump on a, what we call a case study and design call. Where they get to show cases like, okay, this patient came in, this was their test or this is their retest. And we get to see from the providers as well in my own practice, the results that we get and, and the results we get are phenomenal. We get to see not only subject changes, patients feel better, they have more energy, um, less brain fog, less digestive issues, but then also objectively on terms of testing, we get to see changes uh, really, really powerful and it's very motivating for us. So anything else you want to add to that, Andrew? Or I guess any other questions too? I see here a question from Maria. Do patients really pay 10 to 15 K for a program? Yeah, not in our program, but yeah, I know I, we're, we know a lot of functional medicine practitioners and that's um, yeah, that uh, patients will pay that much money for a functional medicine. Program. Can, can I address that too? Sure. real quick, Maria? I think that's a really great question, Maria. And I'm just going to be really honest and hopefully pretty transparent with you. Uh, my wife has dealt with very severe chronic health issues over the year. My wife had thyroid cancer. She had her thyroid removed. She's a whole host of other uh, health challenges, as I'm sure you can imagine. And we have literally spent tens upon tens of thousands of dollars, no exaggeration, in trying to help her. We've traveled literally the world um, seeking out the best we can in terms of helping her. And thankfully, we've gotten some results with a lot of the things we've done. But it's still a moving target to a certain extent. And so I would simply tell you this, I promise you that there are literally millions of people out there, just like my wife, who are struggling, who would gladly pay tens of thousands of dollars for solutions. And so when you ask in terms of would patients really pay that? Yes, they can and they will, so long as you provide meaningful solutions to them. If it's a meaningful solution that actually gets results, which again, I would assure you, um, that what we're doing gets great results for patients, patients will pay and, and they will gladly and willingly pay for that. It's a simple matter of helping them understand uh, the solution and the value in, inherent in that solution. And if they really are looking for a solution, they'll pay whatever it costs. And so we, like I said, we've spent tens of thousands for my wife. I don't regret any of that. Uh, even the things that maybe haven't yielded the results that we have ideally wanted, um, yeah, and I know Andrew's been in the same boat too for health issues that he's had and, and family members and friends and patients that he had. So it really boils down to uh, the solution that you're providing. They, they'll, they'll pay for that. Um, question looks like from Ashley Walker. Um, does, does your program uh, you create involve other tests after this HPA test is, uh, is functional? Um, I, I think what you're asking here, are there, are there other tests that we offer in the program? Uh, and that's a great question. I get this question a lot from a lot of providers. Um, recently, I was on a call with a, a doctor who is very much into genetic testing. And she said, well, if I do this program, can I also do genetic testing? And my answer was, absolutely. Uh, we'll never tell you what tests you should or shouldn't use. Um, the reason we use the ASI test, though, as an initial test is it often, um, it often covers a lot of ground and it's affordable to the patient. So it's a very good jumping off point. If we find, sometimes we get patients uh, occasionally that just don't do well in the program. And sometimes we have to dig a little bit deeper in terms of diagnostic testing. And that's when we would do other types of tests. But what, what we're finding and what most of our doctors across the country are finding is that the HPA test is a good place to start because it covers a lot of the common symptoms that we're seeing in our practice. And so, yeah, we have doctors that use all different types of testing in our program but we're typically leading off with the a HPA test as sort of the first, the first. AI test, you're saying HPA, but I, I think they know what you're saying. Yeah, ASI test, yeah, thank you. <laughs> great, great question, Ashley. Yeah, great question. Any other questions? Yeah, if there, if there are any other questions, we'll gladly answer. But if not, um, hopefully this has been valuable. And again, if you guys want to set up a demo um, and dig in deep with us, we can certainly show you kind of what we've developed. Um, it's a it's a fairly uh, straightforward approach and makes the whole process of helping patients a lot simpler. We really didn't even get into kind of our, uh, our patient education and enrollment process, which is really cool. Um, 
my uh, my office runs 80 to 90 percent of this program for me. Uh, my involvement uh, with the patients uh, in terms of my time and energy uh, is uh, it's scaled back significantly because of what we've developed. And it doesn't mean that I'm not there to help the patients or work with the patients I am, but what we've done is we've leveraged tools and technology such that this program can be run um, largely by a team so that you, the doctor, aren't spending hours and hours bogged down um, you know, creating major disruptions with your existing practice. So it makes it for a really smooth and seamless integration into just about any type of practice. So anything else you want to add, Andrew? Um, yeah, just last thing, if this is something that, that's piqued your interest or something that you weren't, want to learn more about, um, go to uh, the link and set up a demo call. The demo call um, there's no charge for the demo call. Uh, www.simplifiedfunctionalmedicine.com forward slash demo. And we'll do a deeper dive. And I'll go over demo calls are typically with me. And I'll go over exactly how this uh, this program can, can fit into your practice model, help you help more patients, and also help you grow your practice in a very scalable way. Um, and then lastly, I just want to thank you, uh, uh, Christy. Thanks to the team at uh, Cairo Health USA. Uh, for allowing us to be on uh, your webinar series. We greatly appreciate it. And, and we really thank you for helping us get our message out about how to simplify the delivery of functional medicine. Um, we've helped a lot of doctors and, and through our doctors have helped thousands and thousands of patients across the country. This is our mission and our passion uh, in chiropractic. And so thanks for the opportunity to come on here and share this message with, with your group. Thank you all so much. Like I said, this is one of my favorite topics in chiropractic, so I get super excited anytime we get to talk about functional med, and so I'm super, super grateful that you guys took time out of your busy schedules to be here today, um, and thank you so much to our audience for being here for the live presentation, and for those of you who are watching at home, because you couldn't be here at Tuesday sometime between 11 and 2, depending on where you're watching and I'm not even going to pretend like I know when y'all watch this in Hawaii so or Alaska. So thank y'all so much. Just going to remind y'all that next week's web webinar, we're going to be talking about brain balance, reducing cortisol, and its effects on the bioterrain with Dr. Patrick Porter. Um, I am super, super, super excited. I'm sure a lot of y'all have seen his brain tap product at a convention somewhere. If you have not tried this thing, let me tell you, mind blown. Um, it's like my favorite booth to visit when I'm at conventions, right? I know we're supposed to be there to get CE, but that's what I do is I go and play with everybody's products. Then we're going to have my dear friend, Dr. Nona David, coming to us from California, talking about from burnout to million dollar mastermind. I got a sneak preview of this live and in person in DC on Saturday. Just a small, small portion of what she's going to be sharing with us on that Tuesday. But go to the website. We've got tons of great webinars posted for the month of August. You'll see the September schedule coming out very, very soon. And don't forget, if something happens and you cannot attend live, we will send you a link to the webinar recording. And if you are watching this and you have comments and questions that didn't get answered because you're watching the recording, just know those will get emailed to me and I will share them with great doctors and they will get back to you via email to answer those questions. Have an amazing rest of your day. A fabulous week and I'll see y'all next time. Bye y'all.